Welcome everyone on this beautiful autumnal evening here in New York. Tonight is our third panel discussion devoted solely to the art of Japanese painting. With the indispensable technology of Zoom programming, we can connect with an international audience and bring together scholars and collectors from distant locations to join together for about 70 minutes tonight to both educate and hopefully inspire us. We are delighted to have audience members, uh, hopefully on this call, who've registered from 30 different states in this country and spanning six countries from Australia to Germany. Um, but first, on a, a far, far, far more somber note, I, I just have to say that um, the horrific and incomprehensible events of the past week have surely not as failed to uh, escape the attention of everyone here tonight who live on this planet, who has read a newspaper or turned into the news broadcasts. Arguably, now more than ever, we need to seek out and revel in the momentary escape that art, creativity, and beauty can offer us. Hopefully, tonight's discussion will offer some level of comfort to our small but passionate community of Japanese art lovers and maybe even offer some measure for hope for the future of this world. Uh, on a much more um, hopeful note, uh, for those of us lucky enough to live in the New York metropolitan area, and for those contemplating a trip here in the next few months, there is a cornucopia of Japanese art exhibitions at present and another set to open later this year. So um, if you don't live here, uh, start booking your tickets. At Asia Society, the Japanese Art Society of America's long-awaited and perfectly installed Meiji Modern exhibition just opened with a vast array of material from collectors and museums across the United States. Secondly, at Japan Society, tonight, Out of Bounds Japanese Women Artists in Fluxus opens and offers a seminal and critical look at four pioneering women artists of the 1960s. Also currently on view is the important exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in its second rotation, Anxiety and Hope in Japanese Art, curated by Aaron Rio. And this runs through July, 2024. In December at the Brooklyn Museum, the traveling exhibition curated by our friend Joe Earle, Transcendent Clay, Kondo, a century of Japanese ceramic art opens. This will be, consist predominantly of loans from the collection of Jeffrey and Carol Horvitz, and with their generous support, have produced a gorgeous catalog. The show will remain in New York for about one year before moving on to the Minneapolis Institute of Art and other US museum destinations. So what an amazing array of interest in this country for the powerful and inspiring art of Japan. So to move on, tonight's topic on the art of Araki Minor will be approached from an art historical, curatorial, and collecting point of view. Firstly, we have an old friend and a rather important person in my early career, as she is in so many ways, she supported my 1995 exhibition and publication, the Frank Lloyd Wright Collection of Surimono. And as then curator of Asian art at the Phoenix Art Museum, Professor Claudia Brown. The 1995 exhibition at the Phoenix Art Museum and its scholarly and insightful catalog, Araki Mino Nature in Ink, were her inspiration and achievement. She will be with us live at the commencement of the discussion, but then by recorded video due to her prior teaching commitments at uh, Arizona State University. And you can see behind me a copy of the catalog um, from that amazing exhibition, which apparently is in short supply, but may be available online. Another friend of even longer standing is Dr. Matthew Welch of the Minneapolis Institute of Art. His support and that of Mia for many decades have provided staunch advocacy for the field of Japanese art. Most recently, he was the organizer of the exhibition and publication on the ceramic genius and my personal choice of iconic 20th century artist, 
Kamoda Shoji. And you may re remember that from a earlier Zoom talk we did last year. Under his baton, a posthumous retrospective exhibition, Boundless Pink's Ink Painting by Minal Araki, took place at MIA in 2017. It too was accompanied by another important publication, this time authored by Japanese painting expert, Dr. Aaron Rio, who as you know, is currently at the Metropolitan Museum. Finally, and maybe most importantly, we have with us from Santa Fe, New Mexico, the collectors and champions of Japanese art, David Frank and uh, Kazukuni Sugiyama, known universally as Sugi. As you will soon hear, it is due to their passion and stewardship of the extraordinary artist's oeuvre that these memorable exhibitions took place and invaluable books were published. After years of successful support by Eric Thompson at his nearby New York gallery, it was they who recently approached my gallery as a possible venue for offering a few key paintings to our clientele, for which I heartily thank them. And, and finally, um, just as a matter of housekeeping, should you have any comments and questions, please use the QA function uh, at the bottom of your screen and time allowing we will address those uh, questions following the main dis discussion, which we hope will last about 70 minutes or so. So to get started, my first question goes to, to Claudia. Claudia joined the art history faculty at Herberger College uh, School of Art at Arizona State in 1998. Before her current position, she served as curator of Asian art at the Phoenix Art Museum and published several of the museum's exhibition catalogs, including Weaving China's Past, the Amy S. Clay Collection of Chinese Textiles in 2000, and Minol Araki, I already mentioned in 1999. Professor Brown's art historical exhibitions have been shown at major museums such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Denver Art Museum, Harvard University Art Museum, the Musée Chernouchi in Paris, and the Suntory Museum of Art in Tokyo. Her research interests are in Chinese painting and decorative arts, museums, and exhibitions. She has lectured across North America and Asia. Her book, Great Qing Painting in China, 1644 to 1911, was published in 2014 by the University of Washington Press. She is currently finishing work on glorious Qing decorative arts in China to be published this year also by the University of Washington Press. So Claudia, uh, the first question is in your lap. Uh, the, the exhibition in 1999 at the Phoenix Art Museum introduced Iraqi to American audit audiences in a major solo retrospective. Following on your illuminating catalog essay for that exhibition, could you briefly take us through the biography of this very intriguing figure who lived between two worlds? And from your curatorial perspective, especially as a sinologist, what about him is so compelling? And nearly 25 years ago, from that vantage point, and what remains unique about him in today's art historical context. Claudia? I'm very pleased to be here. I've been very impressed by your series of panel discussions over Zoom. And I think it's a great contribution to scholarship uh, as well as uh, broad audiences of, of art collectors and other interested people. So thank you for doing these things. Uh, that's in addition to all the other things in the past I have to thank you for. So uh, Araki Minoru, he was born in Dairen, uh, which was a thriving industrial port city in what is now Liaoning province in China, but before that was a part of Manchuria, which had been under uh, Japanese uh, influence and control. Uh, Immediately after World War II, the Soviet Union occupied the city and all of the Japanese inhabitants were evacuated back to Japan. Uh, Araki had already begun his education in architecture uh, and he had lessons in Chinese painting from a painter who was a friend of his parents, 
all of that in Dairen. But then after returning to, to Japan, he resumed his studies, focusing on design. During his career in industrial design, he worked with various companies. Uh, the best known to me is Radio Shack. I know they're out of business now, but they were very big. Uh, and this took him to the United States and to Taiwan. I think as we'll hear later in the discussion, Taiwan, the, the Taiwan stays were very important, I think. Well, to answer your further question, as a curator in the 1990s, I was impressed with the work of Araki Minoru, which was introduced to me by Howard and Marianne Rogers of Kaikodo, uh, the gallery that you may be familiar with. Uh, aside from his accomplished style, I found him interesting as a rare example of an East Asian painter who maintained his endeavors in painting separately from his, his professional concerns. To me, this seemed very much in the spirit of the Chinese literati painting tradition in which scholar artists had painting as their avocation at the same time they were pursuing a vocation as government officials. So I, I was especially drawn to the scale of the work. You can see some of the works on view in the Phoenix Art Museum Great Hall, uh, which is a space that is actually even larger than it looks here. Uh, and I found the, um, the, the large scale of the work very, very impressive. I was interested that Araki's designer's instincts or sense led him to use compositions on panels, each of which is the size of a tatami mat. And then by bringing them together, either vertically or horizontally, to make these very large scale paintings. In a sense, he transformed the Japanese folding screen into a whole new format, a whole new genre of serried wall-mounted paintings. Well, so we can see this modular approach in some of his design objects and now uh, showing on the screen is one. I would like to show you an actual, I'm not sure, is this, yeah, I think this, this is showing. Uh, so this is the pivot tray and you see it open here. It has trays that can hold things. Uh, this one opens as well, the top one but then it closes to be a very compact object, metal and wood. And if I hold, the, hold it in the light from the window just right, here, perhaps you can see the wood grain, which is very beautiful and it varies from tray to tray. So both the outsides and the insides are very, very much to be appreciated in the same way that the qualities, the gradations of ink in Iraqi's painting can be appreciated. I want to show you too the original box that this pivot tray came in. I think designers always find satisfaction in presenting beauty in the simplest solutions to problems. So, thank you. Well, Claudia, that was wonderful. And um, the show and tell was even better. And uh, <laughs> I think uh, many of us, myself included, who are very aware of his paintings, um, ha have never I've never seen that in person. And to see the man, the work of a man who could create that, as well as those magnificent landscapes in a very classical manner. Um, yes, a, a true literate figure. And um, your insightfulness was captivating. Thank you. Uh, I would like next to offer the next question to Sugi. Uh, Sugi was born in Numazu, Japan, near the base of Mount Fuji. Shortly after graduating from Tohoku University in, in Northern Japan in Sendai, he moved to New York as a designer with the Japanese firm NOL, N -O -L, Industrial Design. His focus was on home electronics and he worked on audio products for Radio Shack, York's, 
Lake, and Lloyd's Electronics. Since his retirement in 1998, he and David have been managing the estate of the artist Mino Laraki, whose artworks they have been entrusted to be placed in major museum and private collections. And actually, in just looking at the list, uh, his works are now in over 19 uh, museums spanning the globe. In his free time, Sugi enjoys watercolor painting, and he has been known to prepare an exceptional dinner, not only something that tastes fantastic, but is a work of art in and of itself. So Sugi-san, uh, my question to you is, the story of Araki Minol, as we know him today in the United States, is very much a part of your own personal story as well. Might you share with us how you first met this extraordinary artist? As experienced collectors and connoisseurs, what drew you to him and to his artwork? Sugi-san? Thank you, John. After my graduation from university, I was working for a Japanese trading company that dealt with electronic product. One day in 1970, one of my colleagues told me that an associate of his was looking for a young guy. That young guy is important. Young guy <laughs> <laughs> who has experience in exporting products to USA. I met that person who was Minoru Araki, and his ideas were very impressive, but his plans were still in the formative stage. He suggests me that I should study design, and then he will open his design studio in New York City. I agreed. And finally, I came to USA in 1973. In the beginning, I found him to be a great designer, and I heard he was a also pretty good brush painter. During a business trip to Taiwan, he showed me some of his works. I thought they are good works but they are not my taste at that time. My interest was more in Nihonga, a traditional Japanese painting. When I was in Taipei, he told me his story about how he met Chanda Chen, the great master of 20th century Chinese painting. One day, Araki was sketching by the Lotus Pond in front of the National History Museum in Taipei. One gentleman was passing and looked at his sketch. They talked a little, and in the end, he asked Araki if he would like to meet Chanda Chen. That gentleman was Yao Mong Ku, a well-known artist and friend of Chanda Chen. After that meeting, they all became good friends, and the Chanda Chen became Araki's mentor. In 1972, Araki me if I would like to meet Chanda Chen. I was more than honored to meet him. I was very impressed, and ever since then, I look at study Chinese painting more. Whenever I had a chance to visit Taiwan, I always went to the National Palace Museum. I began to like Chinese painting more than before, and I appreciate Alex's work. One day in Taipei in 1974, I told Alex that I would like to be his promoter and to introduce his paintings in USA when I retire. He just smiled, but he was glad that I finally understand his works. Fortunately, 
I met David Frank in 1976. I told him my story and I introduced Alaki to him. I told David that I would like to introduce Alaki's paintings to audience in the USA. David accepted my idea and we started slowly to begin this important and joyful job. At that point though, both of us were working, so establishing our goal was not going full speed. At that early stage, the luckiest day was when we met Dr. Claudia Brown, our real activity started from that point forward. I would like to add one more story. Alaki loved food, as did Chandachan, and he often cooked for David and me. That influenced me a lot personally. And now I also loved cooking very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, now everyone in the audience is want to be invited to dinner to your house. Sugi san. No problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, no problem. Okay. Uh, get ready. I just have a really obscure question to ask you. The tie that Araki was wearing when he met Zheng Da Chen was quite yes. extraordinary. Yeah. Did he design that himself? Uh, that tie? Uh, no. No, this is not. Okay. I, I, it's a pretty daring tie to wear uh, in the context of who he was meeting, who dresses like a true literati. I, I, it's almost audacious. I love it. Chandachin looks like a, a saint. Yeah, the, like, nice. yes, like yeah. a senin, and we say in Japanese. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Very <laughs> insightful, and the anecdotes were wonderful. I would now like to turn to the man sitting to your left, David Frank. Uh, David was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, graduating cum laude from Mercersburg uh, Academy and received his BA from Brown University. After being awarded a three-year grant in theater administration by the Ford Foundation, he worked at Mummer's Theater in Oklahoma City and the Actors Workshop in San Francisco. David was the executive director of Trinity Square Playhouse in Providence, Rhode Island, and the advertising and promotion manager of the Theater Guild American Theater Society in New York. Additionally, he was the design and sales manager at Threadtex, uh, Inc., a producer of high-end textiles for the garment industry in New York from 1973 to 1998. David is a former board member of the National Association for Regional Ballet, the former chairman of the Foundation Council of Sight Santa Fe, former vice president of the Santa Fe Chamber Music Festival, and vice president of the Alameda Hill Condominium Association, another wonderful destination for you guys if you happen to get to Santa Fe. So David, my next question is to you. You have access, obviously, to the full range of Iraqi's vast and diverse oeuvre, from portraits to bird and flower imagery to landscapes and in all shapes and sizes. Would you be able to show us a few of the highlights from your personal perspective as collectors and also as close friends of Iraqi. Also, did Iraqi himself have any favorite works or preferred series that you can show us? David? Thanks, Joan. Uh, well, I think Iraqi did have a favorite work and it's also one of Sugi and my favorite works as well. And that is Distant Road from 1978, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Collection. It's a relatively early work and probably his single most important painting. Uh, while Araki had several themes he returned to regularly, he seldom ever repeated the same image. Perhaps the closest he came to repeating an image was this particular work. There's a wonderful and much larger version that is now in the St. Louis Museum's collection titled Distant Road 2 from the following year, 1979. 
actually, there's a third version, which almost no one has ever seen. And uh, now that I think about it, probably has never been photographed. And th that painting hangs in our Tokyo apartment and was probably a final preparatory uh, a sketch for the great painting at the Met. Another favorite work, a group of works actually, uh, for us, and I'm sure for Iraqi as well, uh, is the series of five massive 70 foot long multi-panel paintings that, uh, that Claudia referred to, um, all of which were presented in the Iraqi exhibition at the Minneapolis Institute of Art in 2017. Uh, the exhibition that Claudia did in, in Phoenix had four of the five, um, but the only time that all five have been together was in that uh, Minneapolis exhibition in 2017. Um, four of the five paintings are composed of 12 horizontal panels, each one the size of a tatami mat, three foot by six foot. Um, the fifth painting, which is the absolute tour de force of all of them, uh, which in the Phoenix exhibition was titled Panoramic View of a Dreamy Landscape, and Aaron Rio's catalog for the Mia exhibition, it was titled Boundless Peaks, same painting uh, from 1980. And that's composed of 24 vertical tatami size uh, panels. So overall, it's a monumental six feet high by 70 feet long. Being an industrial designer, Iraqi engineered these multi-panel paintings in such a way that the individual panels uh, or small groups of contiguous panels could be displayed independent of the entire a painting and still be perceived as a full and complete work. Interestingly, four of these five gigantic paintings have ended up in Minneapolis, not by design, but more by happenstance. Bill Clark, who had gotten to know Iraqi and who Iraqi had great respect for, bought the first two of these monumental works to enter a museum collection, the Clark Center for Japanese Art in Hanford, California, around 2002. Flying Dragons Roam the Heavens of 1989 and Heck of a Village from 1985 were the two that, that uh, went into Bill's collection. Subsequently, that museum's entire collection was acquired by the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Years later, Sugi and I donated Boundless Peaks to Mia, and they eventually bought Snow Monkeys at Play in Autumn and Winter uh, from 1992. The remaining 70-foot multi-panel painting from the original group of five, titled Lotus Pond from 1987, was recently acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. A Rocky could create landscapes in different formats too, which were also very impressive and important to him and to us. Here is a pair of very large scrolls, each painting more than eight feet high, uh, ethereal Landscape 1 and Ethereal Landscape 2 from 1991 that were in the Phoenix exhibition and catalog. Together with their mountings, these are over 13 feet high. These scrolls, together with the two panel painting, Cherry Trees Like Clouds from 19, 1990, were painted specifically for an apartment I had just bought that had a double height living room with a 22 foot ceiling. These paintings were intended to be hung slightly above eye level and to be viewed from below. Perhaps someday, hopefully when these enter a museum collection, they can again be viewed from below as Iraqi had intended. Iraqi's other favorite subject that he frequently painted was lotuses. And I would say that Sugi and my favorite, and perhaps Iraqi's too, uh, is the two panel lotus pond from 1986 that was in the Phoenix exhibition. It's now hanging in our dining room in New York. Araki explored a wide range of subjects in his art, including figures or portraits, all of them imaginary figures, not meant to represent anyone in particular. An artist whose work he enjoyed and most clearly influenced his figures and portraits was Egon Schiele. A favorite here is Reclining Nude from 1980, uh, where Araki's admiration and respect for Shiley's work is clearly apparent. Finally, Sugi and I have a favorite bird painting, another of Araki's ma uh, major subjects, and this is the striking and elongated bird of 1978, which 
like many of Iraqi's bird paintings, captures some of the humor and charm of another of Iraqi's favorite artists, Bada Shanren. This painting, together with many of his other bird paintings, show a lighter, more playful side of Iraqi's work. Thank you, David. That was great. And um, I'm just wondering, it, it come, sort of occurred to me looking at your slides, that there's something about his um, monumental horizontality in his work that evokes to me hand scrolls. Um, it's almost as if you're taking the narrative in Emaki Mono and opening it up, whether it be Chinese or Japanese, and entering a landscape and traveling in the landscape. And instead of looking at it overhead on a table, you are looking at it in front of you, and it works so brilliantly. Um, and, and the proportion is very similar yeah. to a proportion of a, of a hand scroll. Yes, action. yeah. Uh, Claudia, could you re-mic yourself? I have, so I wanted to ask you that question as the sinologist in the room. Would you buy that as an idea, you know, that he's looking at that and then blowing it completely out of a proportion in, in a new way? Yes, but I think maintaining that, uh, that narrative uh, spread of motifs that, that hand scroll paintings developed so beautifully. And I, I think you're absolutely right. They are like hand scrolls. I'm interested that sometimes, sometimes Araki seems to uh, move from right to left in the painting, and other times he seems to move from left to right. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe that's, a, that's in relation funny. to your title for, the sh for this pr uh, presentation, this, mm -hmm. this panel discussion, uh, Life in Two Worlds. Is that yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. you describe him as yeah. having life in two worlds? So right to left, moving in time and season, and then but also sometimes moving left to right. So That's, very interesting. I yeah. think it's true. And I, I felt that people looking at the paintings on the walls were traveling within yes. the scroll the way one does when looking at a hand scroll. And of course, looking at a hand scroll, you, you would go from right to left all the way from the beginning to the end. But then you would go from the end back to the beginning yeah. to see it in the other direction as you roll it up. Yeah. So um, very much the same kind of movement. So let's move on to uh, the fourth member of our panel. Um, Dr. Matthew Welch is the Mary Ingebrand Pollard uh, Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. He received his PhD in 1995 and has been with the museum since 1990, first as curator of Japanese art and later in his present leadership role. His current position has him helping his curatorial staff strategically build all aspects of the museum's global collections. While he ne negotiates exhibitions ranging from Botticelli to Anish Kapoor, he still remains a passionate advocate for Japanese art, and I can say that's 100% true. I've been a witness to lots of this. Matthew is a man with more hats than anybody else I know, and somehow he keeps them all up in the air at the same time. So Matthew, my question to you, uh, the 2017 Mia exhibition, Boundless Peaks, Ink Paintings by Mino Laraki, featured at its center a 24 panel ink painting that spanned several walls and gave title to his ex exhibition as we've just heard. But it was also published in the exhibition catalog in a really super way with a multiple fold out format. So thank you for that too. What especially was interesting for you about this particular work? And for your museum, which is truly encyclopedic, what are some of the advantages and possible challenges of displaying such a monumental work over time? Uh, Matthew? Yeah, thank you, Joan. Thank you for that really wonderful introduction. And, uh, you know, just by way of reminder, the show was in 2017, and it was curated by Aaron Rio, now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, who auth also authored the catalog. And so I'm doing my darndest today to, to channel Aaron. Uh, it really was a spectacular show, and I think the you know my interest in Boundless Peaks stemmed from the fact that it was Iraqi's first monumental landscape, this kind of scale, uh, and you know also uh, you know for various reasons not not scale alone, 
um, I think is a pivotal moment in his oeuvre. And so we'll talk about scale in a moment, but um, one of the things that's challenging in a presentation like this is getting you to experience these works uh, in a way that might feel a little bit like you're seeing them in a gallery. And so we've created a kind of live video uh, for you to do that while I continue to talk. And if Bonnie will just advance it, you can sort of traverse the landscape in a way that Claudia was just mentioning. So this um, landscape was intensely personal for um, Araki, I believe, in that it pictured uh, the area around Shimabara, a, a coastal town in, in uh, Kyushu, where his parents were originally born and where he and his mother returned after the war. Now, it's buttressed by water both to the east and west or at the beginning and end of the composition itself. And this may well represent a panorama that, that spans from the Ari uh, Ariake Sea to the Tachibana Bay on the west, thus traversing all the way across the Unzen Amakusa National Park. Although uh, Araki's rendition is not literal, it rather more sort of impressionistically explores that landscape. In fact, he never spent much time in Shimabara, but made sketches there as a young man uh, and significantly returned to the subject much later in life when he chose this subject for his first monumental landscape. So at the same time, stylistically for me, is, uh, the work is important because of its connection to his mentor, Zhang Dejen, who just before Araki rendered uh, Boundless Peaks, uh, Zhang Dejen had completed his panoramic view of Mount Yu, a mountain range in southeastern China. And this work was exhibited in Japan at a hotel in Yokohama, uh, then just before, again, just before Zhang's death in 1983 at the National Museum of History in Taipei. It's now in the collection of the National Palace Museum in Taipei. So like Zhang, Araki utilizes the so-called broken ink technique of layering areas of wet amorphous um, ink brush strokes in rich black, medium gray, and very pale ink onto the paper. So that if you're up close, it, it sort of disintegrates into a very abstract form. Uh, but if you as you back up then, they start to take on meaning as landscape masses. And this is another example where just some minor details, uh, some branches of trees, perhaps a winding path, uh, as David alluded to, uh, sort of make the entire thing make sense. Uh, although close up, uh, it's a very abstract passage. So the other thing that attracted me to Araki, and this is a great example of where he then has a passage, and you're not quite sure uh, what's happening here. Is it a parting of the cloud so that light is striking the landscape? Or is it that you've, you've seen past the deep, dark forests into a plateau area that's filled with light? Uh, but it's it's these passages that help make the um, landscape come to life and be understandable as a landscape. The second um, sort of reason that I was attracted to this painting in particular and Iraqi uh, more generally is this whole notion, the very modernity of his approach in that, you know, as an industrial designer, he's also opted to use an industrial material. Now, this painting, of course, is on paper, uh, but he has them mounted on a, a product known as dye bond, or, which is a kind of uh, aluminum laminate to uh, sheets of aluminum uh, sandwiched uh, in uh, around another material, a rigid material in the center, and creates an incredibly stable uh, and rigid, inflexible sort of uh, substrate for holding the, the painting. Uh, so in opting for this decidedly contemporary material, he's also at the same time freed himself, um, I don't wanna say from the tyranny of traditional Japanese architecture in, in mediums, we, you know, we do refer to the scale of these as tatami-like or fusuma-like. So I just wanna call your attention to what I'm talking about. So of course, these are fusuma in, uh, in, in this case, uh, 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 I think one of the great masterpieces in an American collection, uh, an entire room uh, that constituted uh, a reception hall at the Temple of Daikakuji in Kyoto, painted by Kano Sanraku in the early 17th century. Uh, but in this case, of course, Sanraku is fettered by the functionality of these works. 
right? So you can see on the full scale Fasuma, the poles so that you could open the doors into successive rooms. And the, uh, the lower portion, the, the, the composition depicts rice cultivation, uh, you know, runs along the bottom side because those panels face the garden. Uh, so up the portion up above is uh, translucent shoji screens. So uh, for all of its monumentality, it's very similar monumentality, in fact, uh, that Kano Sanraku is, is achieving in the early 17th century, it's nevertheless tied to the strictures of the um, architecture and to functionality, where um, Araki is able to free himself for that and create this sort of grand monumental form uh, that's incredibly stable uh, uh, that, and that can be you know, traversed some 70 feet. And for those of you that are sort of spatially challenged like me, that's longer than a bowling alley, if you could imagine that. This is incredibly, uh, an incredible suite. But he himself sort of recognized the fact that, um, you know, occasionally they wouldn't all be hung end to end in that way, that they could be broken by doorways and so on. So they become sort of part of that uh, modular idiom that he was developing also in his professional life. So for those reasons, I was incredibly attracted uh, to that work. And then, Joan, I think the yes. other half of your question was the challenges. That's correct. <laughs> and yes, if you um, occupy a you know, 100 plus year old building like we do and many of the grand uh, you know, municipal museums in the, in the country do, finding a 70 foot span of wall space is a rare thing. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, as I mentioned, Iraqi was flexible in the way they were displayed. Um, you know, is the fact that um, Iraqi is achieving what is decidedly a late 20th century phenomenon, if not part and parcel of the 21st century, and that is creating something that is immersive in its experience. And so while everyone is absolutely correct, this is hand scroll like and you sort of traverse it. Um, on this scale, you're also enveloped by it, uh, particularly if it's arranged uh, sim in, a, in a way that's similar to this in our galleries, uh, where you can literally sit um, amid the ma mountains that he's depicting. So, Matthew, the question then becomes, um, what about behind the scenes? These are mounted on aluminum panels. The storage and the handling of these panels must be daunting because the surface of them is fragile paper, but yet they're rigid and I, I don't know about the conservation issues yeah. adhering paper to aluminum. Has that been problematic or you figured out how to do this? No, it has not been uh, problematic. In fact, amazingly uh, stable because the aluminum is rigid. So unlike uh, traditional screens that are paper and wood and that might move slightly with fluctuations of temperature and humidity and sometimes in the context of a museum, I never see this, but you do when you visit places in Japan that with that fluctuation, the, the paper may ripple slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, absolutely rigid. The great thing about this sort of system too, and I, I have to imagine that Araki understood this, you know, with his expertise in industrial design, uh, is that they're light. So they're individual panels that are very easy to handle. Of course, you have to be take care of the edges and so on. It is fragile in that way. Um, we do store them standing uh, with uh, sheets of glassine in, in between mm -hmm. them so that their uh, surfaces are not rubbing against each other. Uh, but in fact, they're they're much easier to handle than a traditional folding screen. Because as you fold those up, of course, you're increasing the weight of the whole thing. Uh, but in this case, you can deinstall them or install them panel by panel. Easy. Terrific. Uh, maybe a new process for Japanese artists in the future. Uh, I would like to turn my next question back to Claudia. We've still got her, which is wonderful. Claudia, we have mentioned your excellent contributions to the Phoenix Art Museum exhibition catalog that has served to educate audiences not only on Araki's bio, but also his strong artistic connection to Chinese literati painting. As a sinologist, could you tell us more about these elements in Araki's works and where you see such influences? And in what ways do you consider him a modern artist with this distinguished literate tradition? I think of you know, Araki's inheritance of the Chinese literati tradition in a general way 
but there are specifics that are identifiable. For example, Bada Shanren, uh, a 17th century artist whose life was profoundly affected by the Manchu conquest of China, painted in bold, inky strokes, lotuses, cats, fish, and these might have uh, inspired Araki to pr produce some of his extravagant brushwork renderings of similar subjects. But I also think of some of the painters of 18th century Yangzhou as possible precedents for Araki's stylistic development. For example, uh, the artist Hua Yan uh, often painted birds, animals, uh, and uh, in lifelike poses observed from nature. And I think that Araki achieved this in his own way in uh, snow monkeys seen in autumn, playing in autumn and winter. Here's the whole uh, composition stretched out on the wall of the Phoenix Art Museum Great Hall. Uh, and you may notice that it goes from autumn to winter left to right, rather than most uh, Chinese and Japanese scrolls that would go from right to left. Uh, but looking at the details of the paint, uh, we find some very interesting poses of the figures and actions of the figures. I'm referring to the monkeys as figures, observed as carefully as one would observe human. Uh, and uh, here, this furry monkey is about ready to, uh, to leap, I think. This is one of the first of the, the monkeys in the, in the composition to write. Um, one of the artists, Hua Yan, uh, that I mentioned, uh, was from Fujian province, but he moved to the thriving city of Yangzhou uh, to find patrons and audiences for his work. And he did, uh, he did try to uh, meet a more general, more popular taste than uh, simply the most elegant of uh, literati landscapes. Um, artists in Yangzhou at that time were entering a new phase of commercial development and uh, we're painting for a living. Detail of several of the animals together gives a sense of how Araki must have uh, made an effort to pose the animals within an ink landscape that is carefully modulated using blank paper, but also white pigment to give the uh, wonderful snowy environment. Um, I think the, the, the Standing up of the of the monkey here is sort of punctuates this closing part of the scroll. So, like bird and flower painters in history in China and Japan, Araki closely observed and carefully recorded the characteristic poses of the animals necessary in order to achieve a lifelike quality. Thank you, Claudia. That yeah. was illuminating. <laughs> Truly. It was it was fun to see the video, but I'm still here for one more minute. In okay. Case you have a do you want to th do you want to throw anything out there? Well, I noticed that there's more to be said about the snow monkeys later on in okay. one of the other presentations. So I'll leave it at that. But I do think that the connection to the Yangzhou artists and probably connection to some of the 19th century artists, especially those working in Shanghai. Uh, ought to be considered. It's not just the Bada Shanren uh, connection that, that we could uh, find some illumination from. Thank you. And I also have to commend so, you for having recorded this just in case and wearing the identical <laughs> clothes sitting in the exact same pose. You had me fooled. <laughs> okay, that was fun. Thank you, Claudia. Good, and send my best to your class. And hopefully Thank they will very. catch it. They will catch it when we post it, hopefully by the middle of next week. Thank You're you. so good to do this. It's a pleasure. Okay, I would like to return to Matthew for the next question. Um, the Minneapolis Institute of Arts collection boasts several extraordinary multiple panels by Iraqi, as we have seen. Could you tell us a bit more about these masterpieces in Mia's collection and from a curatorial perspective, what stood out to you about these works and what did they tell you about the man himself as painter and person? Matthew? Great, thanks. I'm so impressed with Claudia being able to clone herself. I, I've got to figure out how to do that. <laughs> uh, 
So, yeah, I mean, we really are fortunate to have uh, four of the five monumental compositions here at the museum. And uh, I, my task here without taking up all of the time is to run through them um, in video form. And so we'll start here. This is Hecuba Village painted in 1985, just a few years after Iraqi painted uh, uh, Boundless Peaks. And um, unlike the specificity of uh, Boundless Peaks, Hecuba Village is an imaginary place. Um, actually, the name derives from Araki's studio name rather than from an actual place. And in fact, <laughs> Hecuba is also, also pronounced a pipa, which was Araki's, um, of course, uh, name that he used for his industrial design studio. So um, in many ways, this is a, it's a wonderful illustration between Boundless Peaks and Hecuba Village of uh, Araki's transition away from Zhang Dejen's and his use of that heavy haboku, uh, wet layers of ink, to a more studied approach that saw the proliferation of landscape details in trees, in all their diversity, architecture, rocky outcroppings, uh, and, uh, and uh, seasonal elements. And you see that here uh, to great effect in this detail. So too is this use of color uh, in a, a much expanded palette uh, to render both the trees and their various foliage, uh, reds and oranges to connote blossoms or fruit, blues and greens to suggest verdant hills, and so on. Um, all of it combines to achieve a kind of uh, decorative, more decorative impact, uh, which is a hallmark of Japanese aesthetics. I just show here, this is Hekiba a Village uh, displayed in our gallery, so you can get uh, the entire sweep and some sense of scale. The next one, I, I'm fudging a little bit. This is not in our collection. As was mentioned earlier, this was acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, uh, but it's one of uh, Araki's um, uh, lotus paintings. Uh, it, it was, uh, it's 12 panels laid end to end, so some 69 feet long. It was painted in 1987, some four years after Zhang Dejen's death. Uh, and this works and others remind us of Araki's introduction to Dan Zhang Dejen in 1973. Uh, as Sugi mentioned, uh, you know, his chance sketching at the Lotus Pond near the National Palace Museum and then subsequent introduction to Zhang Dejen. Zhang at that point was 74 and Araki was 45. Uh, and through their relationship, Araki was exposed not only to Zhang's work, but to Chinese painting more generally, uh, especially to the works of Esklodievich and the 17th century eccentric uh, painter Badashanren. So commonly associated with purity, uh, Buddhist thought, uh, a purity of, in Buddhist thought, Buddhist deities are often depicted uh, seated atop lotus blossoms, and in Pure Land imagery, the naked souls of the deceased, of course, are born, reborn in Amida's Western Paradise uh, atop lotus blossoms. Lotuses also, of course, maybe more to the point in this case, came to symbolize the virtuous and noble character of Confucian scholars, the ideal learned gentlemen in the East. Uh, as the lotuses rise from the muddy water to bloom uh, on the water, water surface, so do uh, uh, Confucian scholars uh, exhibit their virtue and honor uh, in the face of adversity. So uh, I, I love the, this painting and the, the, particularly the initial passage uh, as it's punctuated with these deep rich hues uh, for some leaves, pale gray in other cases, uh, but uh, of course then have a variety, uh, have lotuses in a variety of states of blossom uh, punctuating the background. So uh, just a kind of dance across the surface. The next one uh, is Flying Dragons Roam the Heavens, a 12 panel composition with panels that are uh, oriented horizontally, depicting dragons amid swirling clouds. And this was painted by Iraqi in 1989, and it draws on a long history of East Asian depictions of dragons. Unlike in the West, where dragons are something to be slain by St. George, for example, uh, in the East, they're greatly admired, thought to be the bringers of uh, rain, uh, that is, in agrarian societies, the bringers of life. Uh, so in Zen Buddhism, they were often depicted with tigers. The tiger came to be associated with earthbound enlightened enlightenment, while the dragon, the soaring spirit of the enlightened mind. And paired together, they're frequently encountered in Zen temples in Japan as pairs of screens or painted on sliding doors. Araki's dragon panels are remarkable for me because of extensive use of black 
And we'll see the overall composition in a moment, but unlike traditional uh, dragon paintings, uh, you know, he he has them barely emerging from the murk of the of of the dark sky uh, to create a, an incredible sense of drama. And I guess the final comment about these uh, incredible paintings, and, and as represented in, in this set from the museum's collection, is that uh, there's a slight humor. Uh, to Jap uh, to uh, Iraqi's depiction, despite their sharp claws and teeth and their bushy their bushy eyebrows, their beards, their long feelers, which I learned in preparing for today's remarks, are called called barbel. Um, they lend a kind of gentle drollness to these depictions uh, of them. And again, it brings to mind the Asian notion of these great beasts as fearsome, but also good. Uh, and you come across this particularly in depictions of the 16 holy followers of uh, Shakyamuni, uh, uh, particularly Handaka or Panthaka, the Indian aesthetic who is often shown with his uh, cohort, uh, Dragon, cradling his head in his lap. And so there's a there's a feeling of uh, the Japanese say uh, a kind of uh, friendship or gentleness to these great beasts. And, and there's a the overall composition. You, you can see here that pervasive use of a very rich velvety black uh, from which these dragons emerge. And then the final composition um, is the monkey painting that Claudia just spoke about. Uh, it was painted uh, much later in 1992 when Araki was 64, and the panels show Araki returning to an assertively Japanese subject, um, the so-called Nihonzaru, or as the uh, Japanese refer to them affectionately, Osaru-san, uh, is a macaque uh, that is native or indigenous only to Japan with their distinctive red faces and bottoms. Uh, there are any number of troops that occupy the three main islands of Japan. They're not on. They're not found on Hokkaido or on the uh, almost all other items uh, 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 islands. Rather, uh, they prefer mountainous areas, but they really can be found almost anywhere. And the Japanese delight in keeping track of them. They are in fact matrilineal um, troops. Uh, the, it's the males that leave the troop in search of mates and have to join other troops, but that's at the discretion of the females that he encounter. So the Japanese delight in following who is the alpha male, who's in, who's out, uh, and uh, which female is reigning supreme. There's some 30 to 40 monkeys comprise the troops, uh, but they can also be as large as um, several hundred. And there are thought to be about 120 of these uh, monkeys still in existence in Japan today. Um, of course, historically too, monkeys have been consi considered auspicious creatures, admired for their cleverness. During the Edo period, trained monkeys would be trotted door to door to perform a kind of ceremonial dance, uh, waving a gohe, uh, a kind of uh, cut paper, wand uh, for, to bestow blessings on uh, members of the household at New Year's. And then finally, in addition to a sort of Japanese nature of the theme, again, they're found only in Japan, Araki's approach, and Claudia is absolutely right about the, the sort of distant uh, nature of the influences here, but his approach to the composition that is pushing these motifs to the foreground, the sort of gentle humor that's implicit in these monkeys and uh, the, um, uh, the transition from seasons from autumn to winter is also all speaks to uh, a Japanese aesthetic. Thank you, Matthew. I, I'm just drawn to uh, recall the troop of Japanese macaques that lives in Central Park in okay. the Central Park Zoo in an outdoor installation because obviously they enjoy all sorts of weather. And I've been spent endless hours watching them play and romp and, and sort of beat each other up and Oh, uh, state territory. Um, and I know many of my artists, who, Japanese artists who live in the mountains, curse these animals on an ongoing basis for the mischief that they cause and, and uh, the nuisance that they become. But in Iraqi's composition, they're absolutely adorable and you want to take one home. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, I would like to move on to um, my uh, second to last question for David. Um, as the title of this event suggests, Araki was a fascinating figure who lived between many worlds. 
And in that sense, you could consider him a very modern individual, arguably even ahead of his time. Since you knew him personally, uh, could you provide us with some insights into how Iraqi viewed himself? Uh, did he attach himself to any labels such as modern or traditional? And did his personal biography actually inform his self-perception as an artist? David? Interesting question, Joan. Uh, to be very honest, Iraqi didn't have the greatest social skills. He was uncomfortable and a little bit awkward, actually, in social settings, especially around people he didn't know well. In his artistic practice, he considered himself an outsider. He never was and never wanted to be a part of the Japanese art world. He didn't belong to or participate in any of the clubs or societies that made up the art scene in Japan. He preferred, in fact, to spend much of his time in Taipei, where he had a home, a large studio, and also a branch of his industrial design company. I, I think he liked the laid back, uh, less structured lifestyle in, in uh, Taipei. He could spend his time in, in Taipei in his favorite outfit, almost his uniform, black jeans and a black denim shirt, and not feel he might be uh, dressed inappropriately. It was there also in Taipei where his assistant who did the mountings on all of his work was based. One thing I know Araki hoped for in which he expressed more than once was that he would be remembered not as an industrial designer, but as an artist. Hence his interest in establishing his own museum, but more about that a little later. He, he also did not see himself as a Japanese artist as much as a kind of modern world artist who was not bound by or, or connected to what was the current trend or fashion in Japanese painting. He traveled quite a lot, absorbed influences from everywhere he went, and lived much of his life outside of Japan with homes in New York and Taipei, as well as an apartment in Tokyo's Azabu Juban and a house in Meguro, where his major studio was located. It, but it was Chinese art and culture really that he gravitated to and Chinese food, I might add, which he enjoyed eating and cooking. And I can say he was quite expert at. One thing I believe Araki had hoped for, which we have not yet achieved and that uh, was that his art might be viewed outside the context of Japanese art, more in a kind of global art context. It pleased him that the two solo shows that we organized in the early 2000s were in a gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico that had never before shown a Japanese artist. It, it's definitely something that Sugi and I would like to follow up on. Thank you, David. I, I hear that from many of my clay artists as well. You know, they're happy to exhibit with me, but they would be even happier if, let's say, someone like Kugosian or um, uh, Goodman Gallery were interested in their work. Um, and that the, the, the passionate desire to rise above the Japanese or Asian nomenclature and to be pigeonholed as a painter. Um, that's great. I have one quick question for you about his studio in Meguro. With these monumental size works. How did he actually physically uh, lay out the compositions and do these panels with such contiguous some, such contiguous design work across, you know, 70 feet of art he had, in, in, in a place in Meguro? Well, it was, it was a house, actually, a, a large house. And so the painting studio was an unusually large room in Japan. He had a gigantic painting table where he could lay out three panels at a time. And he would be working on, on uh, one with the finished one before it, next to it on the left and the upcoming one on the right so that he could design it and lay it out um, in, so that everything connected and flowed without any interruption. Um, so there were always three panels on his painting table. That answers that question perfectly. Yeah. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, my next question is to Claudia, who is magically going to reappear as her clone of herself in a, a video response to my question. The question to her was and remains, is that um, very much in the literati tradition of past centuries, Iraqi was guided and profoundly inspired by his mentor, who we've mentioned many times, is Zhang Dachin. 
what are some of the similarities and influences that you see of his mentor in Iraqi's work? And what kind of resonances do you find between Iraqi's work and other contemporary artists? Iraqi met Zhang Da Chen, who was, of course, one of the most famous painters of the 20th century, Chinese painters of the 20th century, through a connection at the Natural, National History Museum in Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, from Zhang, he may have found encouragement for his bold inky lotus paintings and others. Uh, Stephen Ouyang recounted the various contexts for painting the lotus in his essay for our 1999 catalog. Um, and Araki certainly was aware of some of these historical connections, but I think he was also inspired, as a designer, he was inspired by the, the, the shapes and forms, uh, the structure of the plants. Uh, and looking at this uh, work now, four panels now in the MIA, uh, we see the not only the varying ink tonalities uh, and the wet on um, wet application of ink, but but we also see this uh, wonderful array of uh, diagonals and uprights and even almost horizontal stems, uh, and then the play of the blossoms going this way and that way, uh, and this is what brings to mind Araki's experience sketching the lotus. Uh, at the Nat National History Museum. I'm pleased to say that Araki's work is appreciated alongside other contemporary Japanese artists. And uh, I would add that here in Phoenix, Dr. Janet Baker, curator of Asian art, now emerita at Phoenix Art Museum, has installed just recently this landscape with ancient trees, a two panel landscape by Araki right next to an infinity room by Yayoi Kusama. And I think this juxtaposition is just enchanting with each artist having created a, an imaginary environment, uh, Kusama with her lights and um, Araki with color and form. I thank Claudia and her absence for her comments and now I'm desperate to get to Phoenix and see the juxtaposition between uh, Kusama and Araki. And um, I think it'd be really wonderful to set up a computer there for comments or a book of what the viewers think as they walk through these two very different approaches to landscapes, It'd be amazing. Now I would like to uh, ask my final question of David, the penultimate question. Uh, not only were you both, you and Sugi-san, uh, both personal friends of the artist, but you two are now the stewards of his legacy. Please share with us some of the more memorable experiences over the past decade that you've had in bringing the artist's work to the public eye. David? Uh, well, as I had mentioned earlier, Araki's long-range plan was to ultimately build his own museum. In that regard, many years ago, in the early 1980s, I believe, he bought a beautiful piece of property, the side of a mountain in Chiba, quite a ways east of central Tokyo and not far from Narita Airport, where he planned to site the museum. But as things happened, he died before anything had begun on that museum. In the meantime, Sugi and I realized that a museum rather remotely located in Chiba, uh, showing an artist whose name and work was basically unknown, would not attract many visitors. We felt that a, a major museum exhibition might be a helpful beginning. And through good friends who were mentioned earlier, Howard and Marianne Rogers uh, of Kaikodo, we met Claudia Brown, then Asian curator at the Phoenix Art Museum, who had a wonderful response to uh, Rocky's work when she first saw it and who developed a beautiful exhibition and catalog. That was followed by a couple of solo gallery shows in Santa Fe. Uh, meanwhile, Araki had entrusted the great bulk of his work, more than 300 paintings and sketchbooks, to Sugi and me with the understanding that it would all ultimately be donated to his museum. So as fate had it, he passed away before that work ever began on the museum. Um, and Sugi and I have made it our mission for the rest of our lives to place that work in major collections, public and private, 
and have finalized an arrangement with one institution, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, that will become the leading repository of important examples of all genres and themes of Iraqi's work. In addition, we've planned for the establishment of an Iraqi endowment to fund in perpetuity exhibitions, publications, conservation, scholarship, all of which will protect and ensure long-term Iraqi's legacy. Uh, Iraqi died in, 19, uh, in 2010, leaving us with in excess of 300 paintings. Um, so in the last 10 or 12 years, we've placed or sold multiple works to 16 or so of the uh, 18 or 20 museums in this country, which have large and important Asian collections, especially Japanese collections. In addition, we're in conversations now with several other museums which have not yet uh, uh, gotten representations of Iraqi's work. So we're, we're still moving along and, and I think we're making some good progress. Uh, as the finite number of available works dwindles um, to, I guess by my count, maybe less than 200 paintings, Sugi and I now are finally beginning to feel a sense of, of accomplishment in our legacy building project. Um, I would add that we are very grateful to the many, many friends that we have made along the way. And many of you are in the audience today and, and we thank you, we thank you very much. Well, David, uh, kudos to both of you for not only shepherding this material into important research and uh, institutions that will guarantee that these works go on uh, view and are appreciated and studied in the centuries to come, but that you have uh, designated Minneapolis as the repository of all this material and background information and even have thought to endow uh, conservation and research on the subject which is a dream. And I, I am sure uh, Iraqi is looking down upon both of you with great pride and great gratitude. It's remarkable what you've accomplished. And so my final question goes to Matthew. And uh, Matthew, uh, as part of an institution's mission to educate audiences about artworks in their collection, what can you tell us from your side about this new initiative that's been launched with the collaboration between David and Sugi to continue the understanding and appreciate of Rocky and his oeuvre? Uh, you, yeah. have the, you have the final word. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Joan. I, I just have to pause before reflecting, you know, the institutional stance to I, I just applaud David and Sugi. I mean, I think that they have done so well by this artist. Um, uh, really de dedicated decades of their lives to properly shepherding this material and placing it uh, at places that where people can see it. That um, I know it's not always easy. It's sometimes very frustrating, but they have done such a magnificent job. And and um, you know I have to say that the uh, sort of agreement that we reached with them ensures that um, you know, I should back up and say. You know, the, the greatest stumbling block to doing projects in museums like ours, of course, is funding. Uh, and funding for uh, scholarship, funding for publications, funding for symposiums, exhibitions, and so on. All of that activity um, costs in one way or another. And so in, in setting up an endowment, uh, David and Sugi very presciently, uh, I think, um, set up a system, uh, uh, we're obviously receptive to it, to, uh, that really enables us to um, bring this, surface this material uh, in a periodic way uh, so that the public can experience it. And the, I think the great thing about it is that it's not, it's a, it's a very elastic uh, sort of agreement so that uh, the, the way it manifests can change over time so that we're not repeating the same program again and again, but uh, rather uh, can create completely new programs. In some cases, for example, um, featuring Iraqi alongside other artists like him who really kind of occupied an international stage rather than being specifically a Japanese artist, a Chinese artist, an artist from Taipei, but rather transcended all of those worlds. 
Uh, so um, it, by by staying flexible in the way that we can program, uh, I think it, they really very smartly ensured that programming will take place far into the future. And we're delighted by that. Well, I, I didn't say before, but choosing Minneapolis was a stroke of genius because Minneapolis has such rich holdings in the world of Asian painting um, that the, those kind of comparisons you are talking about do not require loans from outside, but can be done in-house. Um, and I remember even the Mitchell Hutchinson collection um, that you so wisely acquired back, I got, I don't know, 20 years ago of literati painting, both Chinese and Japanese, sort of that sets the stage for Iraqi in certain ways um, of bridging those two aesthetics, one to the other. Um, so um, I'm delighted and we look forward to how you and your curators, if, since you are no longer the Japanese art curator and your curators uh, ongoing, will be able to use the collection in new ways, your Chinese department, your Japanese department, who knows, even your Western art uh, department. So thank you very much. Yeah, All I of fully you. expect to see them in the contemporary galleries. Wonderful, wonderful. And he will be happy up there in heaven to know that. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a, a little time for a couple questions. Um, and um, one, one is a statement that uh, the wonderful painting that is now hanging in Phoenix, it, it paired with the Kusama, according to Janet, who's watching tonight, our curator emerita from the museum, is that it will be on view through summer of 2024. So you've got um, lots of time to pass through Phoenix. Um, one question that's sort of interesting, and I, I certainly don't personally have the answer, and I don't know if either of you or any of you can answer that. As uh, Araki traveled around the world um, to a significant degree, was he ever inspired or ever attempted to work in materials such as oil painting? Uh, actually, not in in a kind of formal way, but but he did a handful of, of uh, oil paintings when he was in New York. I don't think he ever worked in oil when he was in in Japan or Taiwan, yeah. but in New York there are a couple smallish, small yeah, small, rather small paintings, but they are oil on canvas, and mm -hmm. they're and they're um, um, kind of uh, uh, village scenes with buildings and houses and people, uh, trees, not um, specifically anything in particular. I mean, Araki never really. Um, painted with, with uh, a particular landscape or individual in mind. It's mostly imaginary scenes that, that he uh, drew from his own head. Um, and these handful of oil paintings fall into that category and small. Are they good? They're very... <laughs> <laughs> did, did he miss something? By not pursuing it, is the question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Okay, I won't put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> um, another question um, is, he he dabbled, let's say he dabbled momentarily in oil. Did yeah. Araki ever pursue the art of calligraphy, which is such, a, such an important part of the literati tradition? He, he incorporated calligraphy in a number of his paintings, but not his calligraphy, his sister, who is a who was a much finer calligrapher than he was, um, was was enlisted to do the calligraphy on his paintings. Yeah. Um, so they're more toward the earlier part of his career because his sister passed away, sort of mid career on a rocky. And uh, I don't believe there was much calligraphy involved in his paintings after that point. Do you own any of her work? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. I want to see one next time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, another question for you that is several people put in, in the Q&A, Matthew, I think maybe you can answer that. Uh, people are very um, curious as to the actual process of mounting these works of art on paper, on aluminum, and what kind of adhesive is used, and if you could give any insight into the process that mm -hmm. uh, Araki used. Yeah, I, David and Sugi might be the better choice there, but I believe um, we use traditional wheat starch or paste starch or um, rice starch paste 
to right. adhere the paper to the surface. You know, and that's very important because any sort of synthetic glue would darken over time. But the beauty of uh, those traditional materials, wheat starch paste and rice starch paste, is uh, twofold. That doesn't happen, but also, um, you know, it's reversible. So if they needed to be remounted, the, it could be very gently moistened, uh, peeled off of the dye bond and reapplied to a different substrate. That's how traditional mounting takes place. Um, and it can certainly still take place in, in this case. But unlike a traditional scroll mounting, you know, the dye bond's much stronger. It's unlikely that it would be damaged. But if it were, it could be gently removed by moistening it. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um, and, I, just to go back. Oh, please, David, go ahead. Just going to say some of some of the paintings on panels um, were removed from the panel uh, for shipping purposes, uh, and they were removed, rolled up, um, shipped, and then new panels were created uh, for them to be mounted on. This is when we were going from uh, Japan or Taiwan to the States or back. Uh, rather than international shipping these large bulky yeah. panels. Uh, um, it was easier to remake the panel. Wonderful. I can imagine as a person who ships all the time. No, no, but still the scale of these things is monumental. Yeah. Um, uh, Aaron Rio, who we've mentioned many times and the author of the wonderful catalog from Mia, is, uh, has been watching and he said there's an example of Iraqi's sister's calligraphy on a large lotus painting that is currently hanging, or maybe not hanging, but is in your collection, Matthew. Actually, it was on the screen uh, earlier in the program. Okay. It was. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, someone else has asked, are there any paintings of his already in the collection of the Nelson Acton Museum in Kansas City? And um, I have a list in front of me of all the museums, and I believe hen thus far, not yet. Is that correct, David? That is correct. Um, so whoever you are who said that, you give me a call. <laughs> we can fix that. Or David, please. <laughs> Uh, but if people want to know, I'll just read through this list quickly, uh, besides the museums we've already mentioned, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Denver Art Museum, the Hong Kong Museum of Art, Indianapolis, the, the Met, of course, Minneapolis, of course, the Murakami Museum, the Japanese Gardens, uh, Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, Museum of History in Taipei, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Phoenix, St. Louis, San Antonio Museum of Art, uh, the Museum at um, USC, the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, and Yale University Art Gallery. That's an amazing accomplishment, David and Sugi. Oh. It's bravo, bravo. The work sold itself. We really didn't have to do a whole lot. Oh, of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, it's been very illuminating. Um, you've each complimented so many sides of the story of Iraqi. And I think we all feel like um, we know him and his work far better than we did earlier this evening. Um, on a closing note, I just thought I would bring uh, our viewers a bit up to date of, of the show's that I mentioned earlier. Here's a visual at, at uh, the one at Japan Society and Asia Society and the show that will be at the Brooklyn Museum. So keep an eye on those dates and get yourself to New York. Oh, no, I should say something about my gallery. Um, our next show is the Itoe master, Maida Masahiro, in his first retrospective exhibition outside of Japan. And uh, the show that will be opening in um, Chicago of Japanese uh, clay art, and that will be paired with our exhibition it, of uh, Japanese women artists and a panel discussion that we're going to do. Um, so you may want to get to Chicago this winter as well. And finally, our current exhibition is the often overlooked artist Kawamoto Goro and uh, masterpieces by a artist from the Mino area that sort of is off the beaten track uh, for most scholars of Japanese co uh, contemporary clay art. And we have a large body of work that came from his estate. So thank you all for attending. 
and um, please get home safely. Hug your loved ones. These times are very trying. Enjoy the beauty of the art that you have in your own homes and um, be grateful. Just be grateful as I am with our speakers who participated tonight. Thank you very much and good night.